Joe Biden has reiterated his commitments to Israel amid threats of a significant attack from Iran. Speaking yesterday, the president promised American support if Tehran launches an offensive in the Middle East. We also want to address the Iranian threat to launch a significant, they're threatening to launch a significant attack on Israel. As I told Prime Minister Netanyahu, our commitment to Israel's security against these threats from Iran and its proxies is ironclad. Let me say it again, ironclad. We're going to do all we can to protect Israel's security. Well, uh, many fear retaliation after the killing of two Iranian generals earlier this month. Uh, Israel has not claimed responsibility for the attack, but is believed to be responsible. Joining us to discuss this is former senior military intelligence officer Philip Ingram and former Labour advisor Cur um, Current, uh, Matthew Current. It's not, <laughs> not a current. Uh, Matthew Lars. <laughs> I was about to say, I'll tell you one day, in my dream world, in my fantasy world, we're going to have yes. some current uh, <laughs> Labour <laughs> advisors, some current military <laughs> advisor, but great to have you on board. Uh, what do we think about this? Uh, I, I mean, as I said earlier, Joe, Joe Biden seems to give with one hand and take away from the other. Uh, he's just finishing, uh, just finished undermining Israel uh, with his attacks on their attack on that charity convoy. Yeah. And now he's saying our support for Israel is ironclad. That is, of course, in the event of a possible Iranian attack. First of all, Philip, how likely is it that this threatened attack, drones, uh, perhaps direct missiles uh, on Israel, will unfold, will happen? Highly likely. The IRGC, the Revolutionary Guard Corps, it was their commanders that were killed. Um, they changed their flag background to red. Red is the colour of vengeance. I've seen that out on their social media pages. So they will do something. I think Joe Biden's statement was clearly aimed at Iran to turn around and say, you, we're there, you do something direct that is too much and we'll get engaged too. Iran's got a number of options. They can either um, attack directly or more likely they will use some of their proxies. So Lebanese Hezbollah, the Houthis in Yemen, who, who keep attacking uh, Israel and Israeli interests uh, anyway, and uh, some of the proxies that they've got in Syria and Iraq, and they'll probably attack US interests at the same time. I'm going to come to you in a minute, Matthew, but I want to stick with what you're saying about Iran. So we've seen this sabre-rattling before by Tehran, and the next thing you know, three American warships turn up on the coast and says, you dare fire a missile onto Israel itself and you'll have missiles fired back. Um, if they do this and America strikes back, I think the big question here is how capable are Iran? Because once upon a time you think they wouldn't dare, they couldn't stand up for themselves against America and the West and so on and so forth. But how close are they to having a nuclear weapon? And all of a sudden, these, this sabre rattling becomes really quite chilling. Well, that's the $6 trillion question, how close they are to a nuclear weapon. I think if the Israelis believed that they had a nuclear weapon and, and were close to it, then... Tehran would not be here at the moment. Israel would take unilateral action to stop that. Um, but that's not to say that uh, Iran's not trying to acquire nuclear technology from its relationship with Russia or elsewhere. So it's, it's a very dangerous situation at the moment. Um, the international intelligence organisations, that's one of their highest priorities, looking for nuclear proliferation. So they're watching for that very, very closely indeed. The Americans will only react in a controlled way if they think that that's going to have a military military effect. Iran has got a very, very strong military capability, but it's not big enough, good enough, capable enough to take on the whole of the West. However, the West isn't just focused on the Middle East. We've got Russia, Ukraine, we've got um, uh, Middle East, and we've got what Xi Jinping is doing around Taiwan uh, at the moment. That's where the danger is. Mm. It all starts to come together. Uh, Matthew, uh, Sunak and Biden, I think, bear some responsibility for this current crisis. And that is, uh, uh, last week, their anti-Netanyahu rhetoric in the wake of that terrible attack on the charity aid convoy, three Brits killed. Uh, they were right to be appalled, but I think they went too far. Uh, Jake Wallace-Simon, the editor of the Jewish Chronicle, has got a piece in the current edition of The Spectator saying, frankly, because of last week, uh, Hamas have all but won this conflict. So... Uh, Israel has definitely been undermined by this uh, rhetoric from uh, America and Britain. Uh, and therefore, uh, Iran feels emboldened and is making these threats. I'm not sure I buy that, Kevin. No. I think that, you know, I think this is a clear response uh, from Iran to what happened um, to the attack on the uh, Damascus consulate. So I don't think that that's driven by that. I don't think they'd be doing it if, it, if that attack hadn't happened. But they have undermined Israel. But that attack, they haven't. Look, the problem. The person, they have. The person who's undermining Israel most at the moment is Benjamin Netanyahu. 
Netanyahu, who has a mixture of no war aims and playing political games. Um, and he cannot expect a blank check uh, from anybody. Um, and, you know, what we saw last week after the attack on the uh, aid workers was a very fracturing of that Western alliance, which would be needed if we mm. if, if to stand up uh, to, uh, to Iran. Because you said, Philip, Iran hasn't got enough might to take on uh, the West, but it ha probably could have enough might to take on Israel, at least have a proper one, you know, a fight if Israel was much more isolated than it is. Uh, and that's the danger, that Israel isolates but, itself. But, but, but Hamas and, uh, in fact, all of Israel's enemies, Hamas, especially Iran, are emboldened by the rhetoric coming out of Britain and America, which is anti-Netanyahu. Uh, they were furious about last week. Right to be furious, but the complete dismissal of Israel's explanation for this attack... Uh, what, well, I'm not sure the what? Americans did uh, complete No, I, I, I don't that. think they dismissed it. And I think the, well, the, Biden did yesterday. Yeah, but but I, think, I think the issue with what Israel did is they have allowed a lot of their practices over the six months that um, their war against Hamas has gone on. The very beginning, they were brilliant. Their targeting was fantastic, no matter what people say yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, about targeting civilians. But what they've allowed to do is they've allowed their um, elements of the military to not follow the procedures and processes exactly. They're there to stop this sort of thing happening. And a tactical action like that, like uh, attacking this convoy that they thought there were terrorists in, um, when it goes wrong, has strategic implications. And that's what's going on here. Now, a lot of people would look at the situation in the Middle East today and say this is the result of Western foreign policy failing over the past decade or so. In terms of when it comes to the emboldening of Iran, Donald Trump came in and said that nuclear deal is rubbish. They're proliferating uranium. That's not what's going on here. What we need is to actually build relationships between all of the other states, including Israel. The Abraham Accords, I think, were a great feat of creating peace. Um, but then, of course, Biden comes in and says, no, 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 let's get Iran back around the table and great, look how we're being rewarded for that. Um, do you think that that has actually, you know, the, the moves of people like the EU and the moves of uh, America and softening its stance towards Iran and at the same time, people trashing Trump when actually when it comes to foreign policy, he did some very good things. Has that contributed to where we are now? Oh, crikey, <laughs> well, yeah, there's so much in that. Um, I, think, I think we're trying to apply... Western solutions to um, an issue that has been going on for centuries. You know, underpinning all of the problems in the Middle East are not relations between America and Iran and um, America and Saudi Arabia and the EU and Saudi Arabia and all the rest of it. It's a Sunni Shia civil mm. war that is being fought out by proxy and has been going on for centuries between Saudi Arabia leading one element and Iran leading the other element and they fight it out by proxy. Israel then comes in, you know, after the Second World War and, th and throws a spanner in the works of what they're doing. But look at what went 7th of October. Just before that, we were getting a thawing of relations with Saudi Arabia and all the rest of it that was going to potentially bring a longer term peaceful solution into the region. Iran doesn't like it. No. Yeah, Iran exactly. backed yeah. organizations turn around and go whack mm -hmm. and, do, and do that. Mm -hmm. It's the Sunni Shia civil war. So unless we can set the conditions to try and bring some end to that, and I can't see how we're going to do that, um, then all the other stuff is just rearranging the deck chairs. So, Philip, militarily, uh, let's uh, uh, assume the worst, and that Ar Iran does unleash this attack uh, on Israel. Might be direct missiles from Tehran, might be drone bombing attacks that we don't know, but let's assume that they do unleash these uh, attacks on Israel. Uh, then what happens? What does Israel do? Well, the, 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 the Western ships that are in the Red Sea and elsewhere, you know, these missiles have to fly over um, bases where there's Americans and all the rest of it. They'll try and shoot them down um, and tr help defend Israel. Supplied missiles for Israel's Iron Dome, that will stop a lot of it coming in if it is direct or attacks or by, by proxy. Um, and then you know, the West will help Israel respond in a, in a, in a, in a, proportionate, a proportionate way. The difficulty is you're starting to run up the escalation ladder. Yeah. And, and it's very difficult to control the speed with which you ascend up exactly. that ladder. Um, and, and that's what your diplomacy is going to come in and try, mm. try and try and do. Iran can't afford for it to go you know, right to the very mm. top very quickly. And we'll have to remember that, you know, allegedly Israel's a nuclear nation. Now, this is very interesting for your party, isn't it? Because they're the ones likely to assume power at some point this year, at a time when I think the world really is on a cliff edge when it comes mm. to world peace being very threatened. Um, and Starmer himself is really caught in a tug of war between needing a very strong Western resolve, which has to back up Israel, and at the same time, a lot of people in his party being threatened by Muslim voting blocs, being sort of swayed very much by these pro-Palestine marches. Do you think he's got the grip 
grit and the metal to be able to say to people in his party, look, I don't care what your sympathies are, we've got to go down this route? Or is he actually going to be potentially a bit of a risk factor? No, I don't think he's beholden to, to, to the interest in the party. We saw in the Rothschild by-election that because of the firm stand he took, he's paid a political price. There may be something of a political price to pay in the May local elections across the country, actually, in, in key mayoral races, so uh, as well as in key councils. So, no, I think he has stood up to that, but, he can't, but nobody uh, in this country, certainly not a Labour Prime Minister, can give Israel a blank cheque. I mean, as Anthony Blinken, the US Secretary of State, said right at the beginning, it matters how Israel does this. And so, um, from uh, a Labour perspective, the fact that uh, over the last uh, two weeks you've seen Biden, uh, a Democrat president, put pressure uh, on Netanyahu to do it better, um, uh, will help Labour, uh, Labour government stand firm in support of Israel, but not give a blank cheque to the Netanyahu government. I mean, let's all hope, actually, the Netanyahu government isn't there for much longer mm -hmm. and Israel has a better government, because that would be one of the good things for world peace. Uh... Philip, why is Joe Biden so weak internationally? <laughs> why is he so weak about the Middle East? That is the problem. He is absolutely pathetically weak. Uh, you know, him himself, you know, he's, 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 not, he's not competent. You, know, you can see that just the way he, <laughs> there he, is he, that. he gives, yeah. he gives his, you know, the, the way he gives his speeches, the way he talks, and all the rest of it. The advisors that are behind him are trying to balance off, you know, a number of different things, you know, issues that are happening domestically, issues that are happening internationally, um, trying to influence um, a political system that is you know, stuck where you're the Speaker of the House, one person can block um, the aid that is needed by Ukraine to help stop um, Europe turning back into a Cold War again or stimulating the conditions for um, China to go and um, take Taiwan and, and, and elsewhere. The, their political system is completely mucked up. And then you've got the potential for Donald Trump coming in. And you, there's potentially some good things that come in, could come in with him. I'm not a Trump fan in any way, shape or form, but he's so unpredictable. They're trying to manage the situation for that unpredictability that's going to happen. Yeah, and I suppose, like you said, at the heart of all this, actually, it's Donald Trump who inspired that Republican uh, speaker to say, yeah. no, 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 no more aid to Ukraine. And that really could be a bit of a crisis, geopolitical it, inflection point. The problem with this particular crisis in the Middle East is that never have we needed a strong American president more than right strong, now. And competent. Yeah. And, uh, competent. Uh, and a competent yeah. one. Yeah. And what have we got? The weakest president anyone can ever remember. And we, get, oh, and we, and we might get a maverick as the alternative. Who's also mm. incompetent, yeah. incompetent mm. as well. So Whatever that's Trump, the worrying element, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, and I think also looking at in terms of the anti-Western access that's building, I mean, I don't know what both of your thoughts here, because in the background of all of this, of course you've got the relationship between Russia and Iran, and then Xi Jinping, never far away from a drama, and so we have to be tough on all fronts. And you've also got the danger that, I mean, that Europe splits. I mean, that the, you know, last week it looked very very much like uh, Europe was going to have a massive wobble on Israel, yeah. and therefore, that, you know, that's why what Israel, how Israel does it matters. And, and, you know, Vladimir Putin, Xi Jinping... Um, I, the Ayatollah Khamenei, they all see these splits in Europe and they're doing mm. everything that they can through every mechanism yeah. to try and put their proverbial knife in it, wiggle it and make those cracks bigger. Great talking to you guys. Brilliant. Thank Fascinating you. stuff. Thank you to both Philip and Matthew.